Welcome back to The Morning Show here on Arise News. Let's cross over now to our London studio where Arise correspondent Laurie Laird is standing by. Laurie, Boris Johnson just addressed the party faithful. What did he have to say? Uh, it was a jubilant Boris Johnson that announced the party faithful at Conservative Party headquarters, and he uh, he spoke of his desire to heal the nation. Now, it sounded a little bit like his campaign pattern. There was a little bit of something for everyone, lots of new policemen on the beat, lots of new funding for the National Health Service, which is an issue close to very many voters' hearts. He talked about leveling funding in education. He talked about unleashing Britain's productivity, but he ended with his tagline, let's get Brexit done. But he also promised to govern as a so-called one-nation Tory, uh, indicating that he would be much more inclusive in government than perhaps he has been on the campaign trail. And that's raised some questions about whether Boris Johnson may, uh, may govern closer to the center, because he campaigned somewhat to the right of the Conservative Party. But he also lamented the, uh, the, the previous Conservative government, uh, the government that was in charge before he took over. Over, over the summer, he talked about the uh, the three years where nothing was done in government. He promised to put an end to that, and he also crucially ruled out definitively any chance of a second referendum on EU membership. He said those people who are calling for a second referendum should put the microphone, to, put the megaphone down. That that was done. There was no question of that. He talked about a, a bright future for Britain. He talked about unifying Britain unleashing Britain's potential. So he came across as an enthusiastic, uh, uh, a guy, uh, uh, an enthusiastic politician, an enthusiastic prime minister, and he gave the impression that we could see movement very, very quickly, that he is ready to roll up his sleeves and get to work. That's Boris Johnson on his, uh, on his victory speech. It was an interesting speech. He, it, was, it was preceded by a bit of a rap where Boris Johnson, uh, in, 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 a, in a sort of rappy format, talked about about what he plans to do. 50,000 new police on the beat, 30,000 new nurses. Uh, it, was, it was an unusual tactic from a, a conservative politician, uh, but it went down very well with the party faithful. Well, Laurie, do we have a final result yet? Have all the seats been declared? Almost all of the seats have been declared, and the Conservatives have a healthy majority of more than 60 seats. This is so much higher than I think the Conservatives even dreamed about. The polls have been narrowing in the in the uh, the last week of campaigning, and the Conservatives were really sort of dampening down on expectations, saying that they may have just a slender majority. This majority is is far more than pollsters had had anticipated, despite the fact that the, the Conservative Party had a lead of 20-plus percentage points at some points during the campaign, many people thought it would be a lot closer than this. So uh, Conservatives have a very comfortable majority, and this is the first time that we have seen a large majority government since, uh, since the early 1990s. It gives the government a lot of latitude to, uh, to, to work toward its campaign goals. Absolutely. And what can we expect later on today as well, Laurie? I, I, the Prime Minister has given every indication, as I said, that he wants to get to work very, very quickly. Uh, lots of speculation that he will meet the Queen sometime at midday and, and get her blessing to form a government. That's a formality since he is uh, leading the government as it stands. But he will meet the Queen, and I think all of, uh, will be highly likely to come back to Downing Street then, perhaps address the press one more time to address the press with the number that the, the, the backdrop of number 10 behind a prime minister certainly sets a prime minister up in a, in a very statesmanlike fashion. And you can see we're looking at live pictures in front of Downing Street right now. You can see there's a, a press corps lingering there just in case there are any announcements. We don't see the podium that the prime minister tends to use to make announcements, but I suspect that will come out later today. I'd be very, very surprised if we didn't see Boris Johnson give a press conference with that that 
Christmas tree in the backdrop to Number 10 Downing Street. Uh, I suspect he will address the press from that position sooner rather than later. And I wouldn't be surprised if we saw cabinet announcements sometime later today. I think Boris Johnson has spoken so much about the dithering government that preceded him, he may want to give the impression that he is ready to go. So prepare yourself for perhaps a cabinet announcement before the, the close of play today. Now, Lori, there's an air of frustration, particularly towards the north of the country, but Boris himself cut quite a decisive figure on the campaign trail. Do you think that he can actually heal the nation as promised? majority that Boris Johnson has, he may have the latitude to govern very differently than the previous conservative government. Uh, given that very big majority, some people are wondering whether he may move to the center a little bit. And, and, and because he has such a big majority, he doesn't have to spend so much time uh, placating various wings of his conservative party. He may be able to govern without gaining the approval of the party. He's certainly will not be challenged by any kind of opposition in his early days in office. Now, Boris Johnson did pledge in his, his, his victory speech to get Brexit done. That's been the tagline of this campaign, arguably a very successful tagline for the campaign. He has said definitely that the UK will be coming out of the EU on the 31st of January. As for what happens next, there is a schedule on the table. The UK at that point would enter a transition period that would uh, that would run through the end of December of 2020. Should the UK want to extend that, they would need to notify its, uh, the EU partners of, of an extension by the end of June of next year. Now, Boris Johnson has said there is absolutely no way he would entertain doing that. Many economists think that he may struggle to create a trade deal with the EU in the year that he or the 11 months that he'll have available to do so. That would make a, that would be the, the quickest trade deal in, in trade history if the uh, UK and the EU were to come up with a deal. But if that were delayed because Boris Johnson has such uh, impeccable Brexit credentials. It could be that if he has to let these deadlines slip, he may suffer less politically than his predecessor. He has already established himself as someone who wants to get Brexit done. So if there are a few deadlines that slip, he may be able to get away with it in a way that Theresa May, his predecessor, could not. So this, this very large majority that Boris Johnson has certainly gives him a bit of a cushion to operate in many different ways. And that could include moving to the center a little bit. Where does this leave the Liberal Party? Any concerns about the future of the Liberal Party? I mean, that very, very good question, because the during the campaign, the the, uh, the Labour Party uh, campaigned so very far to the left, including a, a pledge to nationalize much of private industry in Britain. The Liberal Democrats seem tailor-made for this side kind of a campaign, with the Conservative Party uh, mostly campaigning on a fairly far-right uh, platform. In fact, many people thought the Conservative Party during this campaign more resembled an English nationalist party, one would have thought that that created a big space for the Liberal Democrats in which to operate. They didn't manage to take off. They gained one seat from the last parliament, but they ex had been expected to do so very much better given that, that, that open space in the center and given the energy of a new leader, Joe Swinson. But Joe Swinson did not campaign all that effectively. And she started out with, with, with a great deal of goodwill, a great deal of popularity. But on the campaign trail, voters seemed to like her. The, uh, like her less, the more of they saw of her. It really leaves the Lib Democrats with some soul searching to do. Jo Swinson, in fact, lost her parliamentary seat, so she will be leaving politics. And it's not clear who will lead the Liberal Democrats or where they go from here. If they could not make a, make parliamentary a political uh, hay in this big center space, difficult to see where the Lib Dems go from here. 
Absolutely. And back to Labour as well, because weary Labour candidates that are taking in the scale of their defeat are also kind of looking at how Jeremy Corbyn's leadership has played a role in all of this. How long do you think that Jeremy Corbyn is going to cling on to power? Excellent question. Uh, Jeremy Corbyn has said that he will lead, continue to lead the Labour Party through a period of reflection, did not give any indication how long that reflection will last. He also made it very clear that he will be not he will not be leading Labour into the next election. The, the betting is that he will leave sooner rather than later. As to who replaces him, well, that's an open question. The far left momentum wing of the Labour Party has said socialism is very much not dead. They intend to, uh, to to try and lead the par uh, the Labour Party from the left side of the party. But some of the front runners, some of the names that are being bandied about as a future Labour leader, include the name Keir Starmer. He made a bit of a name for himself as the shadow spokesman on Brexit, and, and many people thought he spoke quite sanely about Brexit. He was a big advocate for a second referendum on EU membership. He is The bookies are picking him as perhaps the favorite to replace Jeremy Corbyn, but he sits much further to the center. He's a real centrist Labour MP, more in the mode, uh, the, the mode of Tony Blair. Labour will have to decide what kind of party it wants to be. Does it want to move back to the center, or does it want to cling on to that far left platform, which has lost it the past two elections? And so it's difficult to see uh, how labor will, will operate and what kind of party it will be until they, choose the, until they choose their next leader. But I think it's important to note that until labor sets on a new strategy, until labor elects a new leader, the, this conservative leadership, this conservative party with such a big majority will have have very little parliamentary opposition while Labour figures out what kind of party it wants to be. Now, Laurie, we know that the Scottish Nationalists made quite a splash picking up an extra 13 seats. Could you tell us more about that? Yeah, I mean, along with the Conservatives, the SNP, the Scottish National Party are, are really the big winners in this election. They picked up a number of seats at, at the Conservatives' expense, oddly, in Scotland, north of the border. This will embolden Nicola Sturgeon, the SNP leader, to ask for another referendum on Scottish independence from the UK. Now, there was a referendum in 2014 in which Scots voted to stay by 55 percent to stay in the UK. But remember, the Scots Scots were also big fans of remaining in the EU. The Scots are now saying we are being forced out of the EU without our consent. We, we voted to remain in the United Kingdom in 2014 under the proviso that the UK was remaining part of the EU. Now we're being forced out of the EU or against our will. Wait a second. We'd like another vote on independence. Now, another vote in, on, on independence would have to be approved by the government in Westminster. The Conservatives are not going to be particularly likely, particularly keen on giving the Scots the opportunity to break away. So there will be some very tough negotiations between Nicola Sturgeon, the SNP uh, head, and Boris Johnson. How they come out will be difficult to predict and what kind of grand bargain might be, uh, might be struck. But certainly Nicola Sturgeon has already spoken and has said she has no intention of Scotland being forced out of the EU without its consent. So there could be a bit of a showdown between a very popular Nicola Sturgeon, head of the SNP, and, and Boris Johnson. Well, Laurie, we'll take a short uh, commercial break, and then we'll come back to you and ask more questions. We'll be right back. <laughs> You've been paying attention. Welcome back to the morning show here on the Arise News Channel. Still with us is Laurie Laird, a correspondent uh, in the United Kingdom who is in London. Laurie? Laurie, can you hear me? Back again. Oh, yes. Excellent. Yeah, well, we've been talking uh, politics, but I guess there's an economic side to all of this. So how are the financial markets reacting since uh, the outcome of the election? Well. 
Well, uh, it, and this is a worthwhile conversation to have because while Brexit is a, a political operation, it's also an economic operation, and the way that the markets react to this is very important. The Asian stock markets uh, were opening as the results were coming through, and we're seeing a massive rally in Asian share prices led by the Nikkei uh, 225 index. That's the main Japanese benchmark index, up 2.6 percent. All of the other uh, major Asian uh, indices are all up by more than 1 percent. The Chinese composite up 1.4 percent. Hong Kong's Hang Seng Index up 2 percent. And, and much of this is relief that there has been, that this political dre uh, deadlock that we've seen in the U.K. has been ended. The U.K. does have a government. It looks to be a stable government with the majority that the Conservative Party is sitting on right now. This is very likely to be a stable U.K. government. And, and investors are just utterly relieved that there is some semblance of stability coming back to the U.K. It's interesting because U.K. financial assets over the past year have not been trading at all on economic developments, and that's unusual. We We've seen interesting economic reports come out, not least a, a very weak GDP report out in the UK earlier this week. It barely moved the financial markets. It's been all politics driving the financial markets uh, that are related to, to uh, the UK, related to Europe, related to worldwide markets. So the fact that there has been a, a partial political settlement has really settled investors around the globe. I will caution, though, that some of that uh, exuberance in the Asian market is also due to some a tweet from Donald Trump late last night, New York Times, saying that he sees a trade deal between the U.S. and China as, as imminent. So that's also settled uh, investors' nerves a little bit. But investors are saying the fact that there was a conclusive uh, end to the election, there is a, a, a single party governing in the U.K., has certainly brought relief. Now, this seems a little bit paradoxical because this very very heavy conservative majority means that there is no chance of a second referendum. There is no chance uh, at this point of Brexit being reversed. Now, most financial market operators think that the best case scenario for the UK economy would be uh, somehow Brexit being canceled with this electoral victory for the conservatives. That looks highly, highly unlikely. However, there is something. We do have a stable government that gives traders something to play off, and there has been a bit of relief. Sterling is up two and a half percent, almost touched 135 to the U.S. dollar earlier today. It's come off those highs a little bit, but a two plus percent move in sterling took sterling to a 19 month high against the dollar. That is a big move for a widely traded and liquid currency like sterling. So the markets are taking this with a sigh of relief. And to tell you how important this, this uh, Brexit and this particular vote was in the financial markets, yes. Yesterday, the European Central Bank met for the first time under a new president, Christine Lagarde, and she said that by the end of Thursday, we would have a much better sense of where the Brexit process is because we would have the results of the UK election. So even the new head of the European Central Bank was looking toward this election to try and get a sense of what's happening in Britain. So we do have a stable government, and perhaps investors will begin to look at economics developments rather than political developments developments when making their investment decisions in Britain. Certainly, uh, the uncertainty over the British economy has not been lifted. It looks like Brexit will, in fact, happen. But Brexit is a new experiment. No economy has ever left the European Union before. So the economic effects on Britain of the withdrawal from the EU are to be determined, particularly the fact that we, that while Boris Johnson has signed a withdrawal agreement, there's no agreement yet on the table, no agreement even considered yet about a future trade agreement with the EU. So the question marks over the UK economy remain. Well, thank you very much, uh, Laurie, for your insights. Thank, thank you very you. much. And all the best with uh, Brexit <laughs> as the sons of Margaret Tart. Well, we did it. We did it. We pulled it off, didn't we? We pulled it off. We, we broke the deadlock. We ended the gridlock. We smashed the roadblock. And in this glorious...
glorious pre-breakfast moment before a new dawn rises on a new day and a new government. I want, first of all, to pay tribute to good colleagues who lost their seats through no fault of their own in the, in the election that's just gone by. And I, of course, want to congratulate absolutely everybody involved in securing the biggest Conservative majority since the 1980s. Which, which, which was literally, literally, as I look around, literally before many of you were born. And uh, with this mandate and this majority, we will at last be able to do what? You've been paying attention. Uh, because because this, this election means that getting Brexit done is now the irrefutable, irresistible, unarguable decision of the British people. And with this election, I think we've put an end to all those miser miserable threats of a second referendum. Yeah.